we've defined the mean squares associated with the partition of the total sum of squares of the response and found the expected values of those mean squares. In this lecture, we'll see how to use those mean squares to develop a hypothesis test for the slope of the simple linear regression model. So here's an outline of what we'll be looking at in this lecture. We'll first review the mean squares and their expected values. We'll then analyze the ratio of the expected values of the mean squares and use that to understand the behavior of the ratio of the mean squares. We'll then use that to develop an f-test for the slope coefficient beta 1. And finally, we'll use the ANOVA table to organize the calculations for the f-test involving beta 1. So let's first review the mean squares and their expected values. The general definition of a mean square is that it is the ratio of the sum of squares to the degrees of freedom associated with the sum of squares. For the simple linear regression model, the mean square for regression, which is denoted by MSR, is equal to the sum of squares for the regression divided by the degrees of freedom associated with that sum of squares, which is one, and the mean square for error, which is denoted MSE, is defined to be the sum of squares error, SSE, divided by its degrees of freedom, which is n minus 2. Now the expected values of these mean squares are as follows. The expected value of the mean square for the regression, MSR, is equal to sigma squared plus beta 1 squared times S sub xx. And the expected value of the mean squared error, MSE, is sigma squared. Next, let's look at the behavior of the ratio of the mean squares. To do this, we'll first look at the ratio of the expected values of the mean squares. The ratio of the expected values of these mean squares is therefore equal to the following. 1 plus beta 1 squared times s sub xx over sigma squared and that's going to be greater than or equal to 1. Now for given values of sigma squared and s sub xx, this ratio will be equal to 1 if and only if beta 1 is equal to 0. If beta 1 is not equal to 0, then this ratio will be strictly greater than 1. The ratio of the expected values of these mean squares will therefore always be greater than or equal to 1. The mean squares themselves are random variables, and so their ratio, MSR over MSE, is also a random variable. Since each of the mean squares individually will tend to take on values consistent with their expected values, their ratio will tend to take on values that are consistent with the ratio of their expected mean squares. If beta 1 is not equal to 0, the ratio of the mean squares will tend to take on values close to the quantity 1 plus beta 1 squared times s sub xx over sigma squared, which is strictly greater than 1. On the other hand, if beta 1 is equal to 0, the ratio of the mean squares will tend to take on values close to 1. Hence, values of the ratio of the mean squares that are close to 1 are consistent with beta 1 being equal to 0, while values of the ratio of the mean squares greater than 1 are consistent with beta 1 being non-zero. The difference in the behavior of the ratio of the mean squares under these two alternatives provides an intuitive basis for testing the null hypothesis that beta 1 is equal to 0 against the alternative hypothesis that beta 1 is not equal to 0. The important question is this. How much greater than 1 does the ratio of the mean squares have to be in order for us to be confident that the null hypothesis that beta 1 is equal to 0 is not true, and therefore to conclude that the alternative hypothesis, which says that beta 1 is not equal to 0, is true? It can be shown that when beta 1 is equal to 0, the ratio of the mean squares, MSR over MSE, has an f distribution with one numerator degree of freedom 
and n minus 2 denominator degrees of freedom. This result provides a formal basis for developing a hypothesis test about beta 1. And so let's look at this test for beta 1 based on the ratio of the mean squares. So we wish to test the null hypothesis that beta 1 is equal to 0 against the alternative hypothesis that says that beta 1 is not equal to 0. If the null hypothesis is true, the test statistic, f calc, which we'll define as the ratio of the mean square for the regression divided by the mean square for error, that test statistic has an f distribution with one numerator degree of freedom and n minus two denominator degrees of freedom. Let's let f sub one comma n minus two comma alpha denote the upper alpha percentage point of the f distribution with one numerator degree of freedom and n minus two denominator degrees of freedom. If we reject the null hypothesis, if f calc our test statistic is strictly greater than this quantity, this will result in a hypothesis test about beta one that has a significance level of alpha. And so here are the details for the test. Again, the null hypothesis is that beta one is equal to zero. The alternative hypothesis is the opposite of that, therefore that beta one is not equal to zero. We'll denote the significance level of the test by alpha. The test statistic will be denoted by f sub calc, and that's equal to the ratio of the mean squares. So the mean square for the regression divided by the mean square for error. And the rejection criterion is to reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative if our test statistic f calc is strictly greater than the upper alpha percentage point of the f distribution with one numerator degree of freedom and n minus two denominator degrees of freedom. So those are the specifics of the test. Finally, let's look at how to use an ANOVA table structure to organize uh, the calculations for this test. So we can organize the various quantities and calculations for this hypothesis test uh, using the following ANOVA type table for the regression. And so you'll see that we have a source of variation column as we do for a regular analysis of variance. We have a degrees of freedom column, a sum of squares column, a mean squares column, and a column for the F statistic. And so we have a row for the uh, model, in this case, a, for the regression. The second row is for the error as a source of variation. And then finally, the third row is uh, the uh, total variability in the response. And you can see here that we have the corresponding degrees of freedom for each of those sources of variation. And then we have notation for the various sums of squares. And when actually using this, we would put the values of the sums of squares in uh, those particular cells. And we'd also put the values for the degrees of freedom in there as well. Once we have the degrees of freedom entered and the sum of squares entered, then we would divide the uh, values in the sum of square cells by their corresponding degrees of freedom to get the values for the mean square cells. And then finally, once we have the mean squares, we would take their ratio to get the F statistic. So let's summarize what we've done. We reviewed the mean squares associated with the partitioning of the total sum of squares of the response. We analyzed the ratio of the expected mean squares under the null hypothesis and also under the alternative hypothesis and used that to gain an understanding of how the ratio of the mean squares themselves will behave under these two conditions. This led to a two-sided f-test about the slope coefficient beta one. And finally, we saw how we could use the ANOVA table to organize and remind us of the calculations involved in the F-test for beta one. So that's all I wanted to show you in this lecture video. I'll see you in the next lecture video.